Okay, I have a new face on the program. This is uh, Jim Hearn. He's a priest out in Los Angeles uh, with the ACNA. He's a lawyer, but he's also an expert on pandemics. Imagine having that in the ACNA. Well, we have one, and I'm going to talk to him for the next uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes about pandemics, about coronavirus, and the response the church has, society has, and the ethics of it. All right, the audience has seen somebody new on the camera out there. I have a, a, uh, a new guest. He's on the West Coast right now, and he's going to talk to us about the pandemic. His name is Jim Hearn, and he has uh, studied this. He's got a, do you have your doctorate in pandemics? Uh, no, I actually, um, actually, I have my doctorate in bioethics, but my work was in the ethics of pandemics or panethics. Perfect. This is exactly what we need right now, is a priest to talk to us about the pandemic. Um, uh, there's no pressure. Okay. No pressure whatsoever. So uh, thank you for coming to the program on, on such short notice. You were educated at Lo Loyola, right? Uh, I went to, my doctorate is from Loyola, Chicago, but I'm also an um, attorney and went to the University of Southern California and have my um, doctor of ministry from Trinity I think the best way to talk uh, and use your time productively is to talk about kind of how pandemics start, okay. talk about uh, how communities can prevent them in the future. This one's kind of out of the bag. Uh, yeah. The responsibility of the church in this and just our hope in God and our trust in the Father in this. You know, kind of an, a broad ranging interview. Exactly. Uh, and this is, let me do a quick intro. This is the coronavirus. Uh, it's one of seven coronaviruses, uh, COVID-19. Um, it's basically something that invades your lungs in serious cases. It causes your lungs to flood as it's inviting the infection. In that flood, people can die if they don't uh, get treatment for their acute respiratory distress syndrome. Coronavirus at its worst, can cause this. And that's what we're seeing happen in China, Italy, and it's obviously cross borders here to America. And let's talk a little bit about how these pandemics form. This isn't the last pandemic we're gonna have. This isn't the first. And it seems like once every century, we have a really bad one. And welcome to 2020, this is the bad one. How do these things form, Jim? Um, viruses have always been with us, will always be with us, but they don't always infect us. And as you say, you can look at a timeline and periodically, okay, it's almost like they have a watch. Periodically, okay, it's time to become hyper viral. Like, for instance, as we discussed, the 1918 Spanish flu. That was a big one, but we've had several. Like, for instance, most recently, we've had SARS and MERS. And what there has to be is the virus has to be transferred to an intermediate um, intermediary so that it becomes transferable to humans. Like, for instance, with MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the mm -hmm. intermediary was camels. Okay, and you know in China, the intermediary has been swine or has been pigs. With the coronavirus, we think, although we're not sure what the intermediary is, but then it's transferred to humans. And from then, it's transferred human to human. Okay, and there are some viruses that can be more easily transferred than others. The way you transfer coronavirus is, how, you know how they say social distancing, six feet, because that's about the effective um, distance of a sneeze or a cough or um, sending the virus along to others. Um, also, um, there are like for instance on my desk 
if I have the coronavirus and I touch my desk and you sat down and touch my desk, the desk is called a fomite because the virus is on it and it's going to transmit it to you. When the virus is transmitted to you, the, um, the corona virus will start corrupting healthy cells and creating more coronaviral cells and you'll transmit them to others. And that's why you will see, um, if you look at the graphs, okay, the, initially the cases go way up because pe people are newly infected, okay? We don't have any um, immunity. It can be easily transmitted. We haven't had a chance to combat it at all. We don't even know it exists, so we can't distance ourselves from one another. So that's why you see the upswing with any virus when it begins. Well, that's one of the, the differences here. If you look like at the, the Naira virus, mm -hmm. you know, boom, you get that, you're down in hours. It could take out a cruise ship in two or three days. Um, it's amazing how quickly the contagion goes to illness, where with the coronavirus, especially 19, um, they're assuming at, you know, at best they're hoping for 14 day uh, uh, transfer over period. Somebody said 24 from the CDC the other day, which that's just ridiculous. You, yeah, you know, it can't be that long, but you know, guess what? It can. And yeah. so we have a disease that's crossing borders invisibly, that's uh, being transferred from person to person, human to human, invisibly. Right. And right. that's the biggest difficulty here. Yeah, also people don't know when they have it because um, the, the period from the time you're infected until you start showing symptoms is roughly, and again, we're still, uh, we're still fine tuning all this, but we figure it's about 14 days. So you start, it's called a shedding. You start um, giving off virus that can affect others at about day five. So that means between day five and day 14, you feel fine, but you're infecting other people. So um, a virus, a successful virus, is one that can do just that, okay? Is that it's easily transmitted and has a long incubation period um, where it can infect others and the host doesn't know that they're infected. So that's why Corona is scary because it's a good hunter killer. Okay, it has yeah. that mechanism. So you mentioned the pandemic, the, the Spanish flu, uh, yeah. th their guess. You know, when I was a kid, they said it took out 20 million. Now they're thinking it's closer to 50 to 100 million people uh, died worldwide of that. Yeah. Uh, brought on largely because of uh, cargo transports into World War I. It started here, I think, in a, in a farm in Kansas was the their best guess, and it went over and it took out the trenches in, in the uh, yeah. uh, in the fighting in World War One. It, yeah. It's amazing now that we have a global population. How pandemics become global so quickly? Well, imagine back in 1918, we didn't have jet travel, hmm. you know, and someone can be in a market in the middle of China and within 20 hours be walking the streets of Los Angeles, you know, and we didn't have that in 1918. Imagine if, imagine if we had the Spanish flu today with all the modes of transportation, it'd be quite scary. And mm -hmm. you might be glad to know that they've always used, I've always heard between 50 and 100. So people have stopped saying between 50 and 100. <laughs> And what I hear is they say 80, right? Okay, 80. I'll go so, for 80. Okay, million. 80. <laughs> um, all right. So we know that wet markets exist. They should be stopped immediately. Uh, this is you know, something that's come from China my whole lifetime. Uh, there's been something yes. coming out of China causing yes. flu of one sort or the other, MERS, SARS, some serious, some not serious. The problem is uh, the host is the animal. It makes the jump to human which yeah. isn't a big deal until the human to human transitions uh, start yeah. to happen and then it becomes a mess. We need to get rid of, rid of 
uh, wet markets. What can we do as communities and individuals to stop this as well? Uh, and I, let's admit, coronavirus 19, that's out of the bag. I, yeah. I don't think there's any way to really stop that. The R naught is too high, but what can we do as uh, individuals in the future? R naught, that's a good term. I'm very impressed. That's good. Oh, thank you. Um, you know what? I, I, this probably isn't the answer you want, and it's not the answer I want to give, but I don't know that there's a lot we can do. Mm. Okay, the only thing we can do, um, there are some companies. For instance, let's talk about flu, because that's easy. There are some companies, in fact, I think on Netflix, there's a um, several part series on pandemics where one of the things they talk about is there's a company that's trying to develop a vaccine that works against all variations of flu. Because that's you understand correct, yeah. that that's how a virus survives, is it mutates. So if it mutates, this vaccine will still take care of it. Okay, if we get a magic bullet, but short of a magic bullet, all we can do is is play defense. We can't play offense. Okay, so what happens is that when when a virus emerges, okay, it becomes a problem when we don't have any group um, immunity. Okay, when our herd is not immune to this particular virus. So what we have to do is we have to determine the nature of the virus, where it um, originated, and people think because that's the way our culture is today. Okay, great. We know we know where it came from. We know what it is. We know what it does. Give me a shot. Well, that takes quite a while, even with expedited procedures, to create a vaccine. So in answer to your question, I don't think that there's anything we can do to prevent viral outbreaks, we can only react to that today. You know, in the future, I don't know. You know, maybe we'll have access to better vaccine. Um, All right, so let's move on to the ethics of pandemics. Uh, Italy right now is hardest hit uh, as far as Europe. And they have tent cities being set up outside shopping yes. malls and outside hospitals. And yes. people are willing to uh, have grandma in a wheelchair. They wheel her up to be triaged, and they ask her her age. Grandma says, yes. I'm 80 years old. Uh, I've been smoking three packs a day for the last uh, uh, 50 years. And what does the triage person do? Okay. There are, when you're speaking ethically, and the triage protocols. This is where I really got into the meat of it because this is where the rubber meets the road when you're dealing with a pandemic, okay? So if you just want to say, um, I'm a success because look at how many lives I've saved. Well, that means you can save three 90-year-olds and lose a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. You save three to one, but if you look at the life here. So another measure of how you make the triage um, determination is life year. So I would try to maximize the life year. If I have the opportunity to save a 10 year old or three 80 year old, well, I'm gonna look at the average life expectancy and perhaps perhaps err on the side of the 10 year old. And then there's other, other arguments that um, some of the commentators make, like for instance, first come, first serve. That's pretty much been been shown to be unfair, right? Because what if you're not mobile? Um, how about a lottery system? Well, a lottery system really doesn't work because it doesn't maximize the use of our resources. So I think where we end up is um, life years. We try to save the highest number of life years. Now, I wrote an article and I wasn't really popular for writing it, but I thought it was important, so I did it. And that mentioned the concept of social worth and utility. And what I did, I had found um, there was actually um, there was actually a scale used for um, determining how intense a hurricane was. Okay, and it was like 
by, and I thought, you know what? Well, pandemics are kind of like that. You know, they're not all the same. There are 1918, and then there's, there's SARS in Canada that just kind of peters out. So I looked, and, and I kind of situated the, um, the pandemic along this um, continuum. Then I looked at what our ethical duties and obligations are. And what happens is, when you have enough for everybody, your obligation is to the individual. If we had enough respirators for everyone, there's no question, everyone gets a respirator, okay? If we don't have enough, and that's what you're seeing going on exactly in Italy, if we don't have enough for everyone, okay, then how do we decide? Well, let's say that the infrastructure is running, that there's bread in the markets, the lights are on, the what, what, what have you. Um, then what we're going to do is perhaps look at life years, and we're going to try to save life years. Okay, ramp, ramp it up a few more notches and we'll get up to a level six pandemic. And all of a sudden, the infrastructure starts breaking down. And ethically, the duty shifts, I submit, from the individual to the group to society. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, if there's a lawyer and a baker and people are starving because there's no bread on the shelf and you have one ventilator, who do you give it to? Okay, well, you're going to serve many or save many more lives by saving the baker. Okay, that's a social utility argument. And the problem yeah, you're not going to find a lot of protection for lawyers when you always put somebody up against lawyers. So. That's why. That's why. It's a straw man, right? It's a straw yeah. man. Or priests. No, I'm kidding. Yes. But, but you know, so, so there's a shift where you always begin with the individual. It's just like the Hippocratic Oath. You know, we owe do no harm. Okay. But at some point, when the fabric of society is caring, you owe the duty to hold society together, and that might inform your allocation of scarce resources, even if it pains you to do so. Yeah, that's that's a good hard answer. I mean, uh, you know, people have been thinking about this for a long time. You know, when the, when the uh, when the tread hits the road, somebody's got to make some hard decisions, and how do we make those? And years is important, but uh, a structure of society is as well. And uh, we've got to really find out who we really are as, as a people and as a church. Final topic. All right. Now, th this is a hard one because on Facebook, I'll see a priest say, we're closing the church um, and we're not going to have services and blah, 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 blah. And I, I'm quick to point out that we don't close our churches, but we can rearrange our services or have services online. The church, outside of worship, should always be open. And so, in my humble opinion, I think you're, you know, in Kevin's humble opinion, if you want to have wor worship services online and have morning prayer online and stuff like that, there's no problem with that. But I don't know if I'm willing to uh, have a organization like a church where the average age of the individuals who attend it are the people that the CDC tells me I need to protect. Right. Um, God imbued us with a brain and mm -hmm. with the ability to reason. And he did that because he expects us to use it. Okay. You just can't say We'll all show up and we'll pray and God will protect us or heal us. It doesn't work like that. So it means that you have to make some difficult um, decisions. And that's happened at my church. In fact, we had long, serious conversations on how we were going to handle this. And it's kind of changed week by week. Um, the first thing that we did is we eliminated the um, communal cup. Okay. And it's very hard to do communion without using the wine. So what we decided, obviously, is that we're still going to have the wine, but whoever was doing the um, ablutions 
would go in the back and consume it out of sight of the congregation, out of respect for the congregation. And then everything was fine. This week, this week, the discussion got a little bit more intense because things were ramping up. The, um, the stakes essentially were higher and there was serious talk about whether or not we should cancel services. And I like the distinction that you make, Kevin, because no, you never cancel church because church is not a building, okay? But as Christians, we exist as a um, communal people and we come together in worship. And obviously, right, we could all do it via Skype if that were not the case. Um, so what we did last week is, again, we still had the um, communal, or eliminated the um, communal cup. Um, we, <laughs> we waved instead of the peace. And trust me, at my, at my parish, people love the peace. I mean, during during peace, they'll be exchanging recipes. I have you know, never like, been to an active priest uh, a parish where the peace is not five minutes or more. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay, can we do the announcement? Uh, forget it. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> um, and so now this week, I think um, you've probably seen what happened. We're in Los Angeles, and the mayor of Los Angeles um, closed the restaurants, um, theaters, uh, gyms, and asked for people to not gather in any groups larger than 10. So I guess the new game is hoping you're the 11th, right? Because then you have the option to go do something. <laughs> so in, in, in light of that, you know, we, we owe a duty as Christians living in community um, to also like obey and act for the common good even outside of the walls of our church but still it pains me very much to cancel services so we haven't had that conversation yet it's just monday but i think well i know we are going to have that conversation and what we've done too obviously is um we sent around a pastoral letter um, telling congregants if you're an at-risk, if you're a member of the at-risk population and define that for them um, as, as nicely as we could, um, that you should probably stay away from crowd. Um, also, if you're not feeling well, anytime, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be the coronavirus. If you have the flu or a cold, stay at home, okay? Um, and, um, and if you're just anxious, if you have anxiety about being in a group, the fact that the church doors are open, do not feel pressure or somehow that you're um, letting us down or God down by not coming when, for whatever reason, you're anxious. And we also invited them that if you would like, you know, contact us. Okay, we are still available to you, and we'll still meet with you and share with you in prayer, or we'll minister to you, we'll meet you where you are, because in fact, that's what we do when we act pastorally. Now, what I got in exchange for that nice, um, uh, carefully crafted pastoral letter was, you said, um, if anyone's anxious, I think you're fear-mongering. Okay. Oh, okay. Guilty. Guilty. I, I uh, talked to my, my doctor. I had my annual physical last Monday. Passed. I can't believe it. I, I passed it. However. Terrific. Terrific. In, in talking to my doctor, I said, you know, this coronavirus is going out. And what's your biggest worry? He says the hypochondriacs, mm -hmm. the people who think they have it and don't. They call me, they email me, they leave messages, they want to come in. They, there are people who just sit and watch the news 24 hours a day yeah. and convince yeah. themselves that they have this disease. So when they cough once, 
they think they have you know SARS, MERS, or Corona, or if they just feel a little sweat forming on the, the brow, and it, they they just internalize this and make it worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Those are the people who are going to be affected uh, early on by this national pandemic are the people who think they have it. And that's my biggest fear, Kevin. I didn't even, oh, I, didn't, I forgot about that. I used to be one of those. <laughs> you know, when Google first came out, I had every disease I could Google. So, oh, yeah, like the Web, web MD. Web MD yeah. thing. No, <laughs> just, I got I that. Really don't think you realize you just looked up the symptoms of pregnancy. I don't I know, think Kevin. You have you're that. not menstruating, Kevin. It's, yeah. not, it's okay. All right. And so th there's people in society who watch these TVs and watch MSNBC and Fox News. And Fox News and all these channels sensationalize what they say so that you'll keep watching it. And it feeds yeah. upon itself. Yeah. We need to keep these people in our prayers as well. Fear they, yeah, is they really it, wind them up. They wind yeah. them up. Fear is part of the pandemic. Yeah. It's a pandemic are, not of just disease, but of fear. Are you having trouble as evidence of that fear um, back east because we're on separate coasts? Are are you having problems with the people essentially making runs on the supermarkets and... well i mean that's the initial fear and one day and i'm waiting for this somebody's going to make their whole career figuring out why toilet paper they're going to write a book that explains the psychology behind toilet paper loss and i it happened here every store within uh, five miles of my place is out of toilet paper I have a neighborhood grocery, which is fully mm -hmm. stocked, all the fruit and stuff, because nobody outside of uh, Milford knows about it. It's just one no. of those little neighbor neighborhood places, always open, always available. But the major places, the Walmarts, the BJ's, the uh, uh, Costco's, devastated yeah. by fear. Sure. Exactly. And y you find that around the world because people, uh, we are Western consumers and as consumers, we feel comforted by what we find in our storage uh, lockers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yesterday um, at, uh, at church, a parishioner came up and said, so you know about the coronavirus. I, go, I know a little bit of what's up. And you know how we're talking about the hypochondria? I said, well, I might have it. I go, oh, really? Okay, well, um, do you have a fever? Mm, no. Do you have a sore throat? Do you have shortness of breath? No. Do you feel the overwhelming urge to purchase toilet paper? Goes, there you go. Yes, I go, do. you have it. You got it. You have it. <laughs> I mean, more so, than you need. Yeah. So, you know, going back to, you know, for the majority of people who contract coronavirus 19, they will live. They will have a longevity of years. This will be no greater than a bad cold. Some people are asymptomatic the whole way through, and right. they haven't figured out how many yet because they never get tested. You know, there are people who just, you're asymptomatic, you get a little bit of a, a tickle in your throat, a uh, little headache, and you just, you never report it. There's yeah. some people who are at high risk, who uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, if you ever smoked, I would be a, a little bit more worrisome that this is going to be a rough one for you. Yeah. Uh, we have advanced places. If the care is available, you will probably survive. You know, it's, it's a reality of living in Western culture. I'm not speaking to Italy. I'm speaking to West Coast and East Coast. You know, we have very good medical care if we keep it the curve, that flatten that curve, is it, like, like they say. That's if, an important uh, point that yeah. you make. A lot of people, real important. In fact, I wanted to make this point is that when we talk about flattening the curve, a lot of people don't understand what we're trying to do is there is a line. And that line is at our, uh, marks our medical resources. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the cases below that line. And if people think about it that way, all these measures aren't taken to cure people, they're to keep people from being infected so that 
we make sure that we flatten that curve until it can go down because if it ever goes up above that line, that means people are going to start dying because we're not going to be able to treat everybody. All right, people, pray for your church. I need to thank you for your time, your sure. expertise, and I hope we don't have to have you on the program again, but uh, we, we may want to be talking more about uh, this pandemic, hopefully as it ebbs and, and you know we, we get into the point where we talk about protecting ourselves for the next one. Thank you again, uh, Jim Hearns, for all, Hearns, Jim Hearn, for all of your time, and uh, God bless your ministry out in California. God bless you.